Welcome to worship. I'm so glad that you are here. I have just a few announcements to make. Um, and I think uh, Scott has a couple to make as well. Uh, you would not believe how many things go on in this building. And if you would like to find out about all the things that are going on in the building, uh, next Sunday, after this service, I'm going to do a guided tour of the building that will talk about all of the different kinds of ministries that happen throughout the week. And um, I promise you, it will be interesting and, and um, fast moving. And um, I'll try to keep, be sensitive to everyone's pace of movement. Uh, but next Sunday, it'll be after this service. And then in May, I'm going to have one after the nine o'clock service so that people can stay after to see that. Um, so today we also had the beginning of a very good uh, Sunday school class at 10 o'clock, uh, working with Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead. There are still a few copies left, and if you are interested, we really just got the introduction today. If you are still interested in coming to the class, you can see me after the service, and I have some copies of the handouts for you. Third thing is, this evening, um, we are having strategic planning discussions uh, between 5 and 8.30 here in the Maloney Center, and I think they're important. And I would ask you to be in prayer today and this evening for the Spirit to be at work guiding um, the people, most of whom are on administrative council, and a few others, um, as they, as they think about making plans for our future. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott now. Good morning, friends. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements from me. Uh, you may have noticed the red balloons that have invaded the hallway. That is our youth um, fundraiser. This is to help raise money for mission strip and any other youth activity. If you are unfamiliar with the process, you grab a balloon and on there is an envelope with a dollar amount. Uh, you pay that dollar amount and then you can give the envelope to me or to Debbie Sharp and you keep the balloon because I don't need the balloon back. Um, but so, you know, take one, take two, uh, find one you want. If you, if you have a specific number in mind, you can't find that specific number, just go ahead and grab one that's closest to it and just kind of write on the envelope what you put on there. That'd be fine. Don't grab like a hundred dollar one and put one dollar in it because that, because afterwards I kind of count up all the envelopes that went and kind of give a good estimate and it'll throw off my estimates greatly. So try to get as close as you can. Um, other announcements I have like for youth, we are having our spring scavenger hunt over at Bexley Public Library starting at four o'clock. We'll be going around town doing scavengers in the winter. Their ice cream will be paid for. Right now I have a men's team, a women's team, and I have a senior high team. So if you're a youth and you're interested in participating, let me know, I'll sign you up. And then my last announcement is at 10 o'clock, we have a children's choir that is meeting up in room five on the second floor. And we are teaching kids songs to get them ready to sing for a Mother's Day performance. So if you have any elementary age school children who would like to participate from preschool all the way up to uh, fifth grade, uh, they can partake in that and get them ready for a wonderful Mother's Day service. Thank you, Scott. Um, our uh, opening call to worship is again, uh, as it was last week, on the screen in front of you and um, the words will appear and you will read along uh, with the, the beautiful images that are being presented. The opening hymn is number 702. Let us stand as we sing.
may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke. And, well, we'll hear when Jesus appears. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering, and he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Here is the word of God.
This is a come and go place. We come in the morning, we go after the service. In the meantime, however, you may see somebody that you haven't met yet. Well, do that. <laughs> Good morning. Shall we begin by saying our Bible verse? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. All right. So today I brought a container of bird seed to kind of focus you on my story. And this story happened at my is happening at my house right now. So uh, before Christmas, I asked my husband if he would give me a bird feeder for our yard. Now, we've never had any bird feeders. I guess you hit a certain age and you decide you need bird feeders. I don't know. But I decided <laughs> I needed a bird feeder, okay? So <clears throat> we have an issue with a lot of squirrels at our house. We live right down the street. And oh my gosh, the squirrels, they run 
the neighborhood, basically. And we know, I know I cannot plant any tulips because they'll dig, in up, dig them up and they'll eat them. So I go with daffodils, no tulips. So he did his research to figure out which bird feeder would be the best for stopping the squirrels from eating the feed before it gets to the birds. And one of the bird feeders that he researched had a motor on it. And when the squirrel touched it, it would start to whirl around and the, bird, the um, squirrel would go flying off. I was like, oh, that's a little too intense for our yard, okay? <laughs> so he found what he thought was the very best bird feeder for our yard. He filled it and for me after Christmas and we have enjoyed it all winter. We get um, robins and we get wrens and we've had a few birds. I went to the bird, bird books right away to figure out what they were. We've had uh, blue jays. And did I say robins? Okay, I said robins and wrens. All right, so we've had a lot of great birds. Now the one thing that happens with the, um, with the bird feeder is that the smaller birds actually perch on the bird feeder and they eat the feed right out of the bird feeder. But they're kind of messy and seeds drop. And the bigger birds, like the blue jays and the fat robins and the fat cardinals, they all eat it off the ground, okay? Well then, in the spring, since the spring, I have noticed that the squirrels are coming to the area below the bird feeder and they're eating the seed that has been dropped also. And one day there were three squirrels out there. Now, that tells you we have a lot of squirrels. And then on Friday, I looked out, there was a bunny there. Now, I don't know whether bunnies eat bird feed or not, but he was in the same exact spot where the bird feed drops. And all that reminded me of the prayer that we all said at the beginning today. And I'm going to quote, I'm going to say that one line again, because this is what it reminded me of. Teach us to live together in one community, human and creature. The birds and the squirrels and the bunnies in my yard have learned to live together in one community. My hope is that we humans can learn the same lesson. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for the birds. Thank you for the birds. And the squirrels. And the squirrels. And the bunnies of our planet. And the bunnies. Teach us to keep them safe. Teach us to keep them safe. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys. taken part in a prayer for little people, and now for the rest of us. Please pray with me. We are glad to gather this morning, Heavenly Father, in your holy house that reminds us for your love for us and for all people. So much time of working and studying and not a little wondering and hoping makes the kind of day we have one of gratitude. The season around us is changing. Soon we'll see more leaves and have more sunny, bright days. As the season changes, we'll find beauty and excitement and opportunities to make our homes and communities more beautiful. Thank you for a world like that. Remind us, we pray, of the possibilities your love offers us to know each other, to care for each other, to serve and make possible better lives for us and for many other people. That is our hope. We thank you today for those who make possible the kind of worship we are having. 
For our pastor, we give you thanks. And we'll presently listen to a new text and a new sermon that will lead us in our thought and perhaps in a new direction. Our musicians will encourage us to sing as well as to listen to the music of organ and choir and ushers and greeters and those who help in a variety of ways will welcome and respond and make our days good and show us what kindness is. We pray today for the people of our community and our city, like all of our nation, for our voting only about a half year from now. Let us listen wisely and choose carefully when the time comes for us to make our decision. Pray today for those who seek healing and for those who need hope. We pray for children and parents, for those in schools and universities, for workers and those who serve. Grant us wisdom, we pray, that what we do and how we serve will enable those in need to do better. We thank you, God, for your love and goodness. Help us to help your people to love and to serve that all of us may show your love and live in your peace. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now it's offering time, and we share. Almighty God, whose loving hand hath given us all that we possess, grant us grace that we may honor thee with our substance, and remembering the account which we must one day give, be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our scripture today is from the first epistle of John in the third chapter. See what love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Let's pray. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit to be in our thoughts and our imaginations, in our thinking together, in our feeling. We ask that you would help through your spirit these words plant a seed of faith in our hearts that it might set down roots there and bear the fruit of good deeds in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One line from this scripture is part of our funeral liturgy where we celebrate the lives of persons of faith who have gone before us. In the United Methodist liturgy, at least it is. And that is, beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see Christ as he is. And all who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. When we use that phrase in the, the funeral liturgy, we are we're giving it a a broad context in which we're asserting that when we see Christ face to face, we will know ourselves in the way that Christ knows us. We'll see ourselves as Christ sees us as beloved children bathed in the waters of grace. And that will purify us as Christ's child. But I also believe that it has a current reference. In other words, in this life, as, as we come to know Christ more and more, we start to see ourselves as more beloved, more living in a stream of mercy, more given graces that help us see a future that is better than what we are now. And we start to live into that. It's one of the reasons I think uh, many people who have been Christians for a lot of their years uh, really start to take on a, a, a glow of holiness about them. I guess it's not automatic, but I really do think that it kind of happens when people try to walk with the Lord for uh, throughout their lives. I think the rough edges kind of get worn off. And one of the reasons I think that older years are sometimes called golden years is because people's characters have been refined and they glow with the radiance of holiness. This idea of purity and purifying ourselves uh, is an important part of some churches historically that have been called holiness churches. 
I grew up in a, a little bit of a holiness tradition, at least my parents did, and, and it was still part of their way of thinking. And some of those churches that were holiness churches uh, helped uh, advance a notion of purity that was basically abstaining from a list of don'ts. And um, the don'ts were a fairly simple list, really, in many ways. And you probably can imagine what they were. It was, you know, don't cuss, and don't swear, and don't smoke, and don't drink, and don't <clears throat> go to dance halls, and don't go to movies or play cards. Now, th these were lists, actually, that my, my parents' parents kind of grew up with, and it was... Um, a kind of a purity culture, right? This is part of how you identify yourself as a Christ person and, and you keep your spirit pure by not associating with these things that were corrupting influences, I guess. Uh, I'm not uh, here to speak against that at all. I think it's a rather limited concept, but I'm not here to necessarily speak against that. But I think that uh, more substantial ways of thinking about what it means to purify ourselves and to be purified by hope uh, exist. And I want to I probe some of those today, uh, if, you'll, if you'll bear with me. <clears throat> there are some problems, first of all, with purity culture. Uh, purity culture tends to um, make people who can fulfill uh, all of those check boxes of, you know, I, I've taken care of, I don't cuss, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't... It makes them feel kind of self-righteous, and it, it, it tends to make people a little bit judgmental of other people based on their little check boxes. And, and that may not be the best representation of the grace and welcome of Christ. So let's, let's think about purity and purifying ourselves in a, in a different way. Jesus oftentimes, I, I noticed, um, well, I was out pruning my bushes yesterday, and it's amazing to me, I hadn't been outside to work for a while, been stuck in doing indoor things, and um, as soon as I got outside and started pruning my bush, my thoughts just started wandering to things that were really substantial. I was thinking about in pruning the the bush, how oftentimes I feel like more is better. And pruning teaches you that a, a restrained and refined less is more productive. Um, that sometimes cutting things out makes everything do better. And uh, it's counterintuitive for me because we're in a culture that kind of tells us more, more, more all the time. Get more, do more. Uh, know more, relate to more people, get more likes on Facebook, uh, more, more, more. And just as soon as I started working outside, I started getting, nature seemed to be teaching me differently. Uh, Jesus oftentimes was taught by nature, used nature to teach his lessons. He thought about uh, a mustard seed, such a small thing, that seemed insignificant, that could nevertheless grow into a significant plant. He talked about yeast that you don't really see at work and, and seems like it's not doing anything until a few hours later you turn around and it has leavened a whole loaf of bread. Jesus taught about weeds and wheat, about how if you try to pull up the weeds while the wheat's still growing, you may damage the, weed, uh, the wheat's roots and ruin them both. So he taught about all kinds of things using nature analogies. Nature spoke to Jesus. I think uh, many of us spent a lot of time thinking about the uh, solar eclipse this week. How many of you were at some point in the day attuned to trying to see that phenomenon? Yeah, me too. They talked about it nonstop on the news for weeks. How could you miss it? Um, but I honestly think it's because news about the weather 
has become a major part of every news cycle. And why is that? Because it seems like all around the world, nature is screaming out for attention. Isn't it? Mudslides, floods, warmth, these crazy Ohio days. I mean, I grew up hearing, oh, what's the weather like today? Just wait a day and you'll change in Ohio. But now it's on a scale that astonishes me. All around the world, weather is in news. And nature seems to be crying out for our attention. There were people decades ago who told us that this might happen, but it was so abstract and there's so much about the world around us that seems so reliable and regular and indisputably present that it was easy not to listen or believe. But now it does seem like nature is crying out for our attention. Now, I have to tell you that even as much as I believe that Christians are called to respond and see it as part of our faith to respond to the environment, I was not exposed to any such sermons growing up. There weren't very many Sunday school lessons about it growing up. For most of history, we've been able to take for granted the regularity of so much about our environment and its health. And so I don't have many patterns to talk about environmental care as a spiritual act. And it feels kind of weird to me to be even preaching a sermon about it. And yet, nature is crying out, crying out for our attention and for our care. And because I am a beloved child of God, and so are you, I live in hope that even though I can't make huge decisions on a huge scale, I have hope that we can yet do something good to make the world more habitable for a longer period of time, for not just your children and your grandchildren, but for their grandchildren too. And it is those young people looking out to the world and the environment and all that is in it who are most concerned about the quality of basic things like our water, our air, and the animals and creatures around us that provide our habitats that sustain life. Now, I think some of you in some of your bulletins, did you get these green inserts? No. Are they still out on a stack out there, James? Oh, will you get them, Jennifer? We can hand these out. I want you to I want you to take a look. These are just some ideas um, to get you thinking. There are so many different ways that you can start to think more um, with more awareness about how we live and impact the environment and how we can make small changes and choices that make a difference. These are just a few kinds of things. Um, when I was in college, I read a couple of books. Number one, I had a friend who was a vegetarian. And then I also read um, some books that helped me understand um, the impact on the use of water and other uh, energy inputs into the production of meat as opposed to eating a, a diet that was more uh, plant-based. And I saw it at that point um, as part of my Christian response 
to try to eat lower on the, the food chain, as it were, and I became a vegetarian. Now, <clears throat> I realize that saying like you're a vegetarian, it can be like a, a kind of purity culture thing, like I'm a vegetarian, I can't eat what you're eating, and then it becomes a self-righteous thing. And I've really tried not to do that because I'm married to meat eaters and um, have children who, I have children, some of my best friends eat meat. Um, so I try to think of myself, I've now fashioned myself as a scavengerian, um, so that I, I try to, if I'm eating by myself and making choices, I eat vegetarian, but if I'm with people who are eating meat, and my husband will only meet, eat a, a dish for two, two days, so then there's still leftover meat. I don't want that animal to have died in vain, so I will eat it, I'm not the purist. Uh, now, I share this kind of tongue in cheek to say, when we are trying to learn new habits and new approaches to things that are so much a part of our lives, the way we think about the things we consume, the way we think about we, how we go about our transportation, how we go about disposing of our waste, there's we need to have grace with each other and grace with ourselves as we try to make changes. Realizing that none of us is going to be perfect or have all the answers. In fact, scientists are still trying to figure out the best approaches that people can take. But you have to start somewhere. And I would encourage you to start wherever you think you can start. So this sheet does some ideas. You may do none of them, but you may think of other things. What seems to make a difference to me is when I'm trying a new habit or trying to build a new awareness into my routine, is to, is to realize that I'm doing it for God. It helps when I do other things. I am realizing I'm doing it for God. When I'm checking on a friend who's sick or when I'm following up with somebody who's told me something that's troubling them, I realize I'm doing this for God. Things that I do to help our relationship, a harmonious relationship with other animals, with the environment, are also things that I'm doing for God. Take a look at the top of this green sheet on the side with the scripture quotation. I want to look at this um, together and like for us to read down to where it says water all together. Let's try it. All who have this hope in God purify themselves just as God is pure. We can hope in God's good gifts, including water, trees, soil, and air. We purify ourselves by changing practices so that we do no harm, but rather do all the good we can to preserve and protect these good gifts of God. Trying to be a better steward of the earth and of our relationship to the creatures that share this planet with us, to try to do better at thinking about good air and good water and a good environment to leave for future generations is an act of Christian love and devotion. Not one that is ours alone, but one that can connect us to other people who care about this beautiful, fragile planet that we live on and we've been given to take care of. I just wanted to show you a couple of This is a, a scene from Montana. And um, in Montana, there were some young people who, uh, because of a provision in the state constitution that um, 
guaranteed uh, the right to uh, the basics of human life. Um, and I don't have the exact words. There were young people who took the state government to court for issuing, without thought uh, seeming, so many permits for continued fossil fuel dwell, uh, drilling and exploration. And they said, there's plenty of evidence that it is damaging our environment, polluting our air. It's making air more difficult for children and many others to breathe. It's causing increased uh, evident um, risk of asthma. And it is making changes to our world that we are going to have to live with. Well, believe it or not, the judge agreed that they had standing to make their case and upheld their suit. We'll see what comes from that as they work out the details. But notice, they believed that they were children of God, that they had a right to the good things of the earth, and they had hope that their efforts could make a difference. And that's maybe the most important thing of all. Uh, this woman who ended up um, winning a MacArthur a Genius Grant started out as a person who lived in Lowndes County, um, which is a county that has been uh, beset by uh, very uh, terrible racism in its past. And part of the way they were living out that environmental racism was uh, denying residents uh, of many areas in the, in the county uh, access to proper sanitation and good drinking water. Here in the United States, Lowndes County, um, Alabama. And this woman uh, whose mobile home was surrounded by kind of open sewage uh, that was not being cared for. And when people protested about it, the, the county tried to make them pay for the entire cost of the, a new system that would lead up to their house, which was not affordable. Um, and she started a nonprofit and started collecting data, started um, advocating, publicizing the situation that people in the United States we're facing today not having a sanitary um, way of dealing with their waste and also not having clean water because the waste was just going into the levels of the well water that were, people were drinking. And she has started getting attention and they are starting to address the problem. She knew she was a beloved child of God who had a right to clean water to drink and and so she acted in hope that she could make a difference. Do you know where this is? This is in Minneapolis last year. Um, remember the wildfires in Canada? That uh, dry, dry conditions and high winds sent across thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres burning them to the ground and sending all of those particulates down our way. We had days, a couple days that looked kind of like this in Columbus, Ohio. This is Minneapolis, a little farther north. Simple uh, acts like this exacerbate the breathing situation for many, many, many people and send them to the ER and uh, make it difficult for people to work, to study, and it impacts their overall health. Our challenge is to start to shift our way of thinking about what an act of spiritual worship is, to start thinking about ways in which we honor God as the creator of this incredible world. And we believe that as children of God, we are not called upon to act with perfection. We are allowed to make mistakes. We have the right um, and, and the, 
the ability to be forgiven through Christ so we can try to do new things and learn new ways of being boldly because we know we are beloved children of God and we have hope that we can make a difference. Um, two years ago, I didn't do it this year, I should have, I was reminded that for my Lenten discipline, I tried to drive, take the bus to work three, t three times a week. Can't do it every day because I have too many things where I have to leave work and go other places. But I found that um, it was a great experience. I think I need to do it a little bit more. Just it was something that made me more aware of the impact of my car driving. Um, and I encourage you, just try to start to think about ways that you can minimize your impact at, and be a better steward um, of the environment. There are United Methodist Earth Keepers, and there is a movement within the United Methodist Church um, that is helping churches who want to educate themselves about how to think about their own practices from an environmental perspective. There are resources to use, and if you are interested in helping our church be more conscious of the way we care for the earth as we go about our regular daily activities, um, please let me know. And the good news is that we are beloved children of God, and we have hope that the actions that we take can make a difference uh, because God's love is with us. Amen.
You are a beloved child of God. Go forth to live in hope. Amen.